So good afternoon and welcome to this Hive webinar on how cooperatives can empower communities. Um, I'm delighted you can join us this afternoon for this session. Um, I'm Petra Morris and I work at Cooperatives UK and I'm delighted today to bring you this session along with Lancaster City Council and we'll also be joined today um, for this presentation by Chris Coates who works for a cooperative and um, found a member of a cooperative who will talk about his experience. So before I go into um, a few more introductions, and I also welcome Daniel Clark from Lancaster City Council, just a few housekeeping things. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be uploaded and the link will be shared after the session. So don't worry if you about taking notes and things, it will be available. Because it's a webinar, you, um, participants don't have the camera on and we don't have audio. So if you do want to ask any questions as we go along in, in the session, please post those in the chat at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be posting useful links um, in, in the chat as we go along. And hopefully we'll have time at the end of the session to answer any questions. Um, so as I say, my name is Petra Morris. And the reason we're delivering this Hive webinar is that it's um, delivered by Cooperatives UK. We are the um, UK-wide network that represents the thousands of cooperatives across the UK. Um, and as a membership organization, we provide all kinds of services and advice. And we also support the setup of new cooperatives. And one of the ways we do that is through the Hive Business Support Programme, it's a national program delivered in partnership with our member, the Cooperative Bank. We're delighted that they've supported us this last six years, and we've supported about a thousand cooperatives over that time with consultancy advice, um, workshops such as this, and training, etc. And um, we've been running these webinars um, towards the end of last year and into this year, and these are also all available on our website as recordings. And so we have webinars on digital cooperatives. Um, webinars about cooperatives that are in uh, worker owned and freelancers as well as young people um, and some other general webinars that talk a little bit about more in, in terms of legal status etc. Um, so I'm going to hand over now I'm going to stop sharing my screen for the moment um, and I'm really delighted to welcome um, to this webinar our partners at Link Lancaster City Council. I'm going to hand over to Daniel Clark who uh, looks after their community wealth building work um, at Lancaster City Council, and they're going to say a little bit more about what they're doing um, around that agenda. So I will stop sharing now and hand over to Daniel Clark. Thank you. And we seem to have lost Daniel, sorry. <laughs> so um, shall I go back to sharing? Sorry, Daniel, are you there? We seem to have lost him. Okay, I'm going to continue and hopefully he'll join us in a moment. Um, I'm just gonna check the chat to see what's happened there. So I'm sorry about that. We, we seem to have lost Daniel. Hopefully he can join us again in a moment. Um, so I'll continue and just talk about what we, um, sorry, put on full screen, what we'll be talking about in this session. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce what a cooperative is. Um, I'm also going to talk about some examples of um, cooperatives, um, one of which is um, I'm a member of. And um, we'll touch, I'll touch very briefly on registering your cooperative, and we'll also talk about the support available um, if you are thinking about setting up a cooperative. Um, I know that there are people online um, currently that aren't just groups setting up, um, but also um, anchor organizations, local, people from the local authority and other local authorities, and just people interested in learning more about cooperatives. So I'm going to start with just talking about what a cooperative is. Um, so very basically, a cooperative is a group of people working together to meet their common needs. Um, cooperatives are businesses 
And what makes them different from other um, enterprises is that they're owned by their members who control the cooperative and have a say in how it's run. Um, cooperatives can be owned by their workers, their customers, the community they serve, or a combination of those. And some cooperatives may only have three members, as in typically maybe a worker cooperative, or millions of, of members. So membership is very much at the heart of every cooperative. It's the purpose that cooperatives are set up for. It's what drives the purpose and, and how the cooperative is run. And um, so, as I mentioned, a cooperative might be set up by a group of workers who just want better livelihoods and fairer working conditions and to have more control over their working lives. Um, or it could be set up by the local community because they want to take on assets um, and services and run them in the way that serves them best. Um, and or it can be just as um, it could just be you as a customer, maybe going into your local um, cooperative convenience store and, and shopping there. So there's lots of ways to be a member and lots of reasons why people set up cooperatives, which we'll talk about in, in this presentation. Um, so members can be the owners and the shareholders um, and they can invest in the cooperative, but that shouldn't be the primary aim um, to make money. Um, members, um, because cooperatives are businesses, they do make profits, but it's how those profits are distributed in the cooperative, um, which is different to other co-ops. Um, so for instance, in a worker cooperative, if they make profits, they may distribute that evenly across the members, um, or if it's a community co-op, it might go back into the services and the assets and the community they're serving. And most importantly, because cooperatives are owned by their members, members have a say and a control in how that cooperative is run. So what really defines a cooperative and makes it different from other businesses or social enterprises are these values and principles. And these are values and principles that are enshrined in cooperatives, across the whole world, not just in the UK. And we have an organization called the International Cooperative Alliance that sort of looks after these principles and checks that cooperatives are meeting those principles. Um, so I'm very briefly going to touch on each of these principles. Um, and these are important because if cooperatives aren't working to these principles, then essentially they, they probably are not a cooperative. So they are really important. And I, I suppose the first of thing to say about um, these principles is that membership is open and voluntary. So again, to use the um, scenario of going into your local co-op shop, you can shop there even if you decide not to be a member, it is, it is voluntary and open. Um, democratic member control, as we mentioned before, because cooperatives are owned by their members, they have a say in how it's run. And member economic participation, that's really, again, going back to the idea that you can invest, you can get rewards, um, you get the benefits of the cooperative and how it's run, um, or you can earn interest or dividends. And because cooperatives are there to run and, and are there for their members, they are um, independent organizations and they're there for the purpose of their members. Education and training is really important for members to make those decisions and um, about how the cooperative is run. They need the skills and information to do that. So education is a big part of cooperatives, as in as is cooperation among cooperatives, the idea that we support one another and we promote cooperatives. And finally, concern for the community. Nearly all cooperatives operate in their communities and they support them. Um, and social impact and social value is usually a big part of being a cooperative. So we know that cooperatives are successful. Cooperatives have been around for a very long time, for more than 175 years, not that far from Lancaster. Rochdale was the first cooperative um, set up by the Rochdale pioneers, and they also established those earlier principles that we talked about. Um, and we know that cooperatives, because of the way that they're formed and because they're there for their members, have a much higher survival rate than traditional businesses, almost twice as, as high, in fact, um, as you can see from this graphic. 
And we think the reason for that is that cooperatives are there for the long term, they're there for the interests of their members and their community. Having a stake and control over how the cooperative run is run makes people more motivated, gives them that stake, um, makes it, you know, allows innovation. And that idea of doing good is really important. That social value is really important. So all of these things in terms of how cooperatives are run really makes them more resilient and more successful. And we've seen that more than ever in the last couple of years um, in the wake of the pandemic. We've seen that cooperatives have generally um, been more resilient. Um, they have been four times less likely to cease trading. They've continued to want to be ambitious and to grow. And I think it's because because they're there for their members and controlled by their members, they tend to be flexible and be able to pivot. And we've seen lots of cooperatives during the pandemic change their, their kind of role and, and do things like mutual aid and support their communities more. Um, so we know as a model that there are good reasons to run cooperatives and have that ownership and control and that it does make them a much more successful model. Um, and cooperatives exist in all sectors of the economy. There are more than 7,000 cooperatives across the UK, everything from food growing to retail to digital, housing, and there are cooperatives everywhere. Um, and they are owned by their 14 million members. They're growing each year, each year and they contribute nearly 40 billion pound to the, co uh, to the UK economy. So it's a really important part of, of, of um, the economy. So I don't, we seem to have lost Daniel. I don't think he's come back and um, I'm sorry about that. But one of the things that he would have talked about at Lancaster City Council is uh, the work they're doing around community wealth building and, and, and their sort of values there. Um, and Cooperatives um, UK has been working with lots of different local authorities and in dif different areas. And, and we take a place-based approach um, around community wealth building. The idea of that is really putting control of um, assets and services and businesses in the hands of local people and people who care most about those services. Um, and so that's an agenda that we very much promote. And we think that cooperative enterprise and control and ownership of these um, services and assets are really powerful and does allow for people to have better livelihoods, um, to breathe new life into assets and services. And um, so um, I have a couple of examples here of how that operates. And one of those is our funded program. Um, and this is a program delivered by Cooperatives UK called Empowering Places. It's funded by Power to Change. Um, this is the fifth year of this program. It's an eight million pound program delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with CLES and NEF. Um, CLES is the Center for Local Economic Studies and NEF as a new economics foundation. Um, and we've been supporting six areas across England uh, from um, up in Bradford uh, down to Plymouth, working with their anchor organizations and catalysts to give them support and grant funding and really to help them look at how community businesses and cooperatives can create better places and reduce that inequality in local areas. Um, we'll have more evaluation and more to report on how that program has worked. And I'm sure other areas um, will be looking at this in interest to see how they can do that as well. And this also builds on the Preston model. I'm sure this is familiar to lots of people. Um, it's not just Preston, but the wider Lancashire area. Um, and again, the local authority um, and anchor organizations are working very hard to let people have more control, to look at progressive procurement, to allow asset transfer, um, and cooperatives are very much at the heart of that, those democratic businesses to allow people to have, have that control. So I'm going to touch on some example cooperatives um, just to hopefully bring it to life a little bit more. And we will be joined after this also by Chris Coates from a cooperative in Lancaster called Holton Mill. Um, one of the cooperatives I'll talk about is one that I'm also a member of. So 
I kind of wear two hats, not only at Cooperatives UK, but this, this um, cooperative. So these are just examples of how um, people, members have come together to form cooperatives to kind of either solve their problems or find better solutions when things are broken and not working in the way that they would like them to work. So here we have um, some examples around um, health and social care, and I think everybody knows that um, health and social care often doesn't work either for the people working in those sectors um, or for the people receiving the care. And so these are a couple of examples of new cooperatives that are trying to find um, or have found alternatives, um, and really the model of ownership has, has made that work better for them. So Signalize is a new cooperative supported through the High Business Support Programme they set up in 2019, um, and they provide uh, deaf interpretation and translators to the deaf community currently operating in Merseyside. And their members are both the interpreters and the beneficiaries of those services so that they can collectively decide and, and manage that cooperative, which therefore makes it much more successful um, traditionally in this industry, deaf translators work through agencies and they're not very well paid. And then for the deaf community, often it's the case that they can't access the services that they need um, when they need them. So um, this is kind of a matchmaking service and um, putting the two um, together. Um, another cooperative that's fairly new um, is Equal Care Cooperative, which operates in the upper Calder Valley. And again, this is the idea that both the care beneficiaries and the care providers are members of the cooperative. Um, it's what we call a multi-stakeholder cooperative. And both, both sets of members have control and say over how the cooperative is run and they decide how the service is operated. And this makes for a much more successful um, way of delivering the social care. Um, and both of these have recently um, been commissioned for contracts by their local authorities. Um, and so that's a really good success story. <clears throat> so I'm just going to touch on this very small cooperative, which is just outside of Manchester in a place called Chawton. We seem to have quite a lot of cooperatives around Greater Manchester, and particularly in Chawton. Um, but I talked before about in the wake of the pandemic, the fact that um, lots of cooperatives are turned to mutual aid and, and, and their communities and supporting them. And Totem Bike Deliveries really came out of that. So right at the start of the pandemic, in the first lockdown, um, a group of people decided to do deliveries to local people um, on their bikes, um, food parcels and, and medicines, et cetera. Um, and they've gone on through the help of the High Business Support Pro Program to set up as a cooperative, and their members are the people delivering, as well as the businesses that they serve. Um, and it's again, it just shows how how having a cooperative model just formalizes things that people are, are doing anyway, and it, it sort of builds on the values of cooperatives in terms of self responsibility and self reliance. Um, so it's just an, an, an interesting model that came out of mutual aid and they are now operating as a trading cooperative. And this is another example of a community coming together to run um, a um, service and an asset. Um, and this particular one is Radcliffe Market in Greater Manchester near Bury. Um, there's been a market there for a long time, since the 1800s, and the council have been running the market, but in 2018, they put it out to tender, and rather than it going out to a private company, the community came together, set up a community benefit society, and they are now running the market, and their members are the storeholders and the users of the market, and as well as traders and food, they also put on entertainment and community events. Um, and as it said here, it's, it's about keeping that money local. It's about um, their wider aims, not just to run the market, but to invigorate um, the local town. Um, and that's another good example of cooperatives taking um, responsibility of assets and services that mean a lot to them. So for my final case study, um, 
and cooperative is one I mentioned that I'm also a member of. And this is Friends of Stretford Public Hall. Um, so you can't see the building very well here, but these are the members of, of the cooperative and the founding members. Um, some of those um, aren't, aren't um, members anymore, but they, they um, did found it. Um, and so the hall is a beautiful grey two listed building. It's Gothic style. It's very big and it has a wonderful ballroom for up to 400 people. It's been around since the late 1800s. It's been a library, a pool, uh, a theatre. And then lately, um, in the late uh, 2000s, it was run by Trafford Borough Council, used as their offices. And then they put it out to tender in 2015, and it could have been purchased by a private investor and turned into, um, continue to be offices or turned into flats. Um, but a small group of people, local people in Stretford, which is just outside of Manchester, not a particularly affluent area, but they decided that it should stay in community ownership and be used for the community. And it would be a shame to lose such a wonderful asset and building um, to the community. And they set up Friends of Stretford Public Hall as a community benefit society, which is a type of cooperative um, that's owned by the local members, the local community. Um, and since then, in 2017, they raised £250,000 from their community in something called community shares. So we have 800 investor members um, and they all con contributed this money. It could have just been a charity and they could have just donated. But the important thing about community shares, it means that everyone has a vote and they have a, um, an opportunity to join the board. Um, and lots of investors who use the building have also become volunteers. Um, so it's a really important part of being um, a cooperative rather than just maybe a charity or social enterprise. And I'll talk a little bit more about what community shares are, but um, the building has gone from strength to strength. We have um, thousands of people use it every day for events, um, exhibitions, music, weddings. We also have an artist studio and a co-working space. Um, and it also has invigorated the local economy as well. So um, we have a wider mission than just the hall. Um, and as I say, because I invested, I then had the opportunity to join the board. So I am a volunteer society secretary at Stretford Public Hall. So just to say something about community chairs. Um, so I mentioned that um, Lots of community societies, um, cooperative societies, can um, raise funds from their members in the form of investment. This is a unique patient type of finance only available to societies. Um, community shares has grown substantially over the last 10 years um, from a handful of community share offers to now hundreds of communities raising over 180 million pounds from their investors. Um, and this has allowed communities to save um, assets such as Stretford Public Hall, to save um, libraries and swimming pools and pubs and post offices um, and all kinds of services. Um, so it's been a, a huge success story. And it's a unique type of finance. It's very patient. It's equity. And you can't trade it. You can't make money on it. But you can occasionally earn interest if the business is doing well. Um, and we have a programme of support that allows people to apply for funding um, and also get matched equity funding. So it's become a very popular way for communities and very successful way for communities to raise their funds. So I'm just I'm not going to say very much about registering your cooperative and how to start one. And we have resources on the website other than to say that I mentioned earlier that cooperatives are defined by their principles um, and not by their legal status. So a cooperative can be any legal form. You can choose from any of these. You can be a company, a society, um, a partnership, um, a community interest company, and you're still a cooperative. And we have what we call model governing documents um, that are available for all of these models, um, legal forms, um, that you can adopt, um, and they include the principles that I spoke about before. 
If you do want to set up a cooperative, we have um, support around that, but we also have this wonderful resource on the website. It's called a step-by-step -step guide. And as it suggests, it literally takes you through each of the steps of setting up your co-op from testing your idea, from how you finance it, your business plan, and also helps you to think about your legal form, as well as offering an online registration service, which is um, a partnership with Cooperatives UK and funded by The Hive. So um, I think that sort of, um, um, I'll come back to support and next steps. So that concludes my um, presentation. I can see that um, Daniel has joined us um, in the corner there. So I'm going to stop sharing for the moment and hand over to Daniel, who will talk about Lancaster City Council. And then we'll, I'll then hand over um, to Chris to talk about his particular cooperative. Um, so I'll stop sharing and hopefully Daniel, you're okay to share your slides if you can give me a thumbs up. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Petra. And thanks for your patience with um, the IT issues. And hopefully I can share my screen and we can get into the, um, the presentation. Can we see this now? Can we hear me? We can hear you, but there's nothing on the screen, Daniel. Oh, it's coming up now, I think. There we there go. We go. Excellent. So yeah, fingers crossed I don't get cut out, but thanks for your patience and I won't take too long because we want to, to stick to the agenda really and the main content being from Corps UK and Chris. But my name's Daniel Clark. I'm the Community Wealth Building Officer with Lancaster City Council. Um, so just want to say thanks really to Corps UK for organising this webinar today and also for Chris for taking some time out to share some of his experiences um, as a cooperative. And also thank you everyone for attending. I hope it's a useful hour of um, content. So this is, a, this is a background really to the, the direction of the council and community wealth building. Now I appreciate this is quite a small text document, but this should be in the chat if you want to look at this in more depth. If you look to the top, there's four priorities which indicate the, the organizational culture and service delivery at the council. So we've got a sustainable district, an inclusive and prosperous local economy, healthy and happy communities and a cooperative kind and responsible council. So you can see the direction and the intention of the council with those priorities. And the, the left hand side are the themes which are the main kind of work streams to address those priorities. So we've got the climate emergency, community wealth building, which is my area of work and community, community engagement. So with community wealth building in mind, and I'd like to think that through this webinar, you'll, you'll recognize that cooperatives play a key role in this kind of agenda. This is a definition from CLES, which is the Center for Local Economic Strategies. Um, so the definition is simply that community wealth building is a people-centered approach to local economic development. It redirects wealth back into the local economy and places control and benefits into the hands of local people. So I think you can see through that definition that it's broadly looking at social, economic and environmental well-being, but cooperatives are an important process within that um, economic development approach. Now, within that kind of broad economic scope, there's a specific framework to um, deliver community wealth building. And my work really is looking at these, these pillars and looking at the areas that we can amplify community wealth building. So very briefly, the top one is progressive procurement. And that's the idea that through you know public sector procurement we're in a position to potentially procure goods and services from local smes and businesses with the intention of localized wealth and retaining localized wealth within the area but also delivering social value through that procurement practice and increasingly looking to procure goods and services from generative businesses such as cooperatives um, and social enterprises Democratic economies, now that's also termed plural ownership of the economy, and that directly relates to this webinar because that's the, uh, the approach to specifically grow and develop alternative business models, such as social enterprises, cooperatives, community interest businesses, et cetera, because um, they're seen to be more generative for the area. Um, so yeah, so that's that pillar. Fair employment, so the council is a real living wage employer. Um, we're also developing a fair work charter. 
So these are the things that we're looking to progress internally, but increasingly we'll be looking to do that externally as well and promote these values within the um, business community and economy. And of course, the values of cooperatives correlate to that quite um, closely. I'm sure Petra has alluded to some of that in the in the webinar. And then the final two is the use of land and property, and that's the the concept that as, as anchor institutions, the council and other anchors can effectively utilise their land and property for communal use or you know community assets and things of that nature. The final one is financial power, and that's the idea around kind of um, circular economies, but also things such as cooperative banks. I know that in other local localities, cooperative banks have been developed and have been really successful for the community. And then just really bringing that to the local area within Lancaster, we are aware that we've got a really diverse third sector. We want to support that sector and grow the sector. Obviously, during COVID as well, we we saw a lot of kind of community empowerment, a lot of community groups deliver, delivering services and potentially cooperatives could be a way to formalize some of that act activity and achieve you know longevity of community empowerment we'll hear from chris in the moment we want to share best practice of some of the existing co-ops in the region but also we've got really um you know the big universities and statistically young people are more uh, likely to start up cooperatives and that's something that's a dynamic that we want to explore as well in terms of growth but well, that's just a very broad kind of quick introduction to myself and some of the work that I'm involved with. If you wanted to get in touch, we are looking to get in, involved with community groups, businesses um, to influence this developing community wealth building agenda. So th these are my contact details if you did want to get in touch. So that is everything for me. Thank you, Petra. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, yes, sorry about the technical problem earlier and that we no lost worries. you. And so thanks very much for joining us. And yeah, as I say, we are delighted to um, be working together in partnership with Lancaster City Council on this webinar. So I'm going Great. to hand over now, if that's okay, to you, Chris. Um, Chris um, is a founder member of a cooperative just outside of uh, Lancaster, um, Horton Mill, which is called Green Elephant Cooperative. Um, and he's going to share um, what they do and, and why they're a cooperative. Um, so hopefully he'll be able to share his slides and, and um, thanks very much for joining us today, Chris. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see the slides on the screen. Um, yep, my name's Chris Coates. I'm, as Petra said, I'm one of the founder members of um, Green Elephant Cooperative, which manage um, one of the last industrial buildings on, um, on the River Loon, not just in Halton. It was a very large um, industrial site spread along a mile of the riverbank originally that um, fell into decay from the sort of 1980s onwards really, and was designated as a redevelopment zone for housing and to try and retain a a sort of element of employment site. Um, I, as I go through, I will sort of try and explain how we came about. Um, so we've been going since um, uh, 2013. Uh, why won't my slides go? Yes, okay. So in 2013, um, former Loonside Engineering Works, um, was had been empty and derelict for over two years um, and the previous developer of the site had gone bankrupt and the site was bought as part of a um, redevelopment for what's called a co-housing scheme and part of the original planning application um, from the bankrupt developer was that you had to provide some employment um, space to replace the lost um, the lost sort of employment in the village. Um, so um, we, we came along, a number of us who were interested in building the houses, which I've got some pictures of later, and we transformed this um, semi-derelict building. It was still um, structurally sound, um, but needed a lot of renovation into what we now call a low carbon workspace. This is pretty much Holton Mill today. Um, 
the view that was previously. We're about approximately just under 2000 square meters of, um, let, of space in the building. Most of it divided up into offices and workshops. And um, that's, that equates to about 22,000 square foot of office and workshop. So a significant um, amount of space. Um, the renovation of the building was um, part funded by um, an initial uh, grant from the central government um, when, when you could get grants um, for low carbon intervention in, in sort of local communities. It was largely though funded by the European program, the RDPE program, um, which we matched with a commercial mortgage from the Ecology Building Society. So that's sort of how the initial renovation was funded. So inside we have um, largely on the, the upper floor, we have a series of um, individual offices. Um, we divide, we spent the, the renovation money on um, insulation, new windows, and a new heating system and rewiring the building. So we have a, a selection of offices. Um, we also have a, a co-working space. Um, we discovered um, fairly early on that it was very easy to find uh, tenants for small offices, but the larger offices were difficult to let. So we um, set up a co-working space, which took a while to take off, but at the moment is at post the sort of end of the pandemic, we're getting lots of inquiries of people who slightly fed up working at home I think and and, and want, want a sort of shared office um, so that has been very popular. We also on the ground floor which are mainly um, workshops have a what we call Loon Lab Makerspace which is essentially a club of hot local hobbyists so um, local people in the village um, who want to come in and use equipment uh, so you you can join this at cost 10 pound a month and basically you've got access to um, woodworking machinery and a pottery studio we were beneficiaries of uh, some of the equipment is loaned but we were essentially beneficiaries of um, the county council closing down the adult education center in the middle of lancaster or, at white cross and was basically disposing of a lot of equipment. And if we hadn't taken it, um, it would have gone in a skip. Um, so a lot of um, the equipment came from that. We have a sort of training room next door where people run courses. Um, obviously they've been canceled, were all canceled because of the pandemic, but we're slowly getting back to running uh, pottery classes uh, well, until, and until recently, jewellery classes. So we also have uh, a dedicated yoga studio on the top floor. This was um, this is run by one of the uh, yoga teachers, and she lets it out to other practitioners. Um, quite frankly, I did not know there were so many different forms of yoga. Um, myself, but there are, and that we can be having two, three, even four classes a day, um, mothers and babies classes, Pilates classes, um, and that's partly because pretty much certainly in this end of the district, there is no space that is purely dedicated to um, this sort of um, yoga. You, the the other places that are available are in sort of community centers where you have to clear the chairs away and, and set up every time. This is just an open space um, that's purely dedicated to yoga and sort of keep fit type activities. Um, we downstairs, we have a sort of canteen space um, where people can have their lunch and we can also cater for classes and, and events. Um, we have a large, what we call the atrium. Um, and strangely, this only exists because we ran out of money. Um, the architect we were working with wanted to sort of put more workshops, 
if this is a double double height space and we've ended up using it for all sorts of events this is a, a local craft fair um sort of christmas craft fair that we've organized we've also had concerts in there um we found that it was a, a very adaptable space um and it has also um, we've got outdoor space. This is, in fact, a little community festival utilising our car park and garden. Um, so that's a sort of broad, um, broadly what, what we do within the building. The reason it sort of happened at all is because, and you can see in the background in this, um, there was a group, what is this, of what is essentially a, a grand self-build scheme, um, not self-build in the that people sort of physically built their own houses, but in the grand designs sort of self-build. And they were looking for a site and bought the former Loonside engineering site and so and built um, 35 um, eco homes, they get called locally. They're built to a German passive house standard, so they're super insulated. And as well as uh, the houses, which are one bed, two bed and three bed houses, there's a sort of clubhouse called a common house um, where that residents can use. And there are various other communal facilities. There's a laundry. And this is where the sort of the bit of the title of the cluster of co-ops come in because there are 35 households on the same site and uh, interested in sort of sharing things um, very quickly it became obvious that um, there was need for a food co-op these are a sort of bulk bulk buying co-op so we the the co-op buys food from um, wholesalers so we use Suma, which are a big whole food wholesaler from Leeds. And we also buy from local community um, vegetable growing schemes. So who think we're great because they run box schemes, but we take vegetables by the sack full. And then uh, they use a small store and it's basically run by volunteers and we get good quality food at a reasonable price. I wouldn't say it's cheap, um, but it's um, it's a reasonable price. And um, so that has um, about 40, 50 members. And um, some people use it as a corner shop when they run out of things. Other people um, are doing quite a lot of their um, regular shopping from from the, the food co-op. And it is turning over about 20, between 20 and 25,000 pounds a year um, through, through it. Um, doesn't have any employees, it's entirely run by its members. So the other um, cooperative on, side, on site is Lancar, which is a cooperative car club. Um, it owns seven vehicles at the moment, uh, three uh, electric cars and for other um, petrol and diesel cars. It is part of the emphasis on the housing scheme was to um, try and re reduce people's carbon footprint and therefore try and reduce car travel. So this, we reckon this probably, each car here probably replaces about 10 vehicles. Um, and yeah, I would say probably two thirds of the households on site are members of the car club and don't have their own private cars. Um, there is an online booking system, so you can book a car by phone um, from your mobile phone um, and you can see what cars are available. Um, and there is also, you can you'll notice there's book the ghost car. So we that's if there's no car available, um, we need to know um, that there is more demand um, than we've got cars for. So, and, and it has slowly grown. We started off with three cars and it has grown, as I say, grown to seven cars at the moment. Um, and 
just in case you want to know why we're called Green Elephant, um, which is a question I was posed right at the beginning. This is Raja the Elephant, and Raja the Elephant was built at Holton Mill in the 1950s um, by the um, Loonside Engineering Works, which were a group of Polish refugees um, who'd set up an engineering firm, and they um, they turned their hands to anything, including building um, mechanical elephants. We managed to track one down, which is owned by the Crosby Lions in Liverpool, and they brought it back. And these are our, uh, some children who live here riding on Raja the Elephant on the day we opened Holton Mill. So we named ourselves after the elephants because somebody told us that if you want to really remember, name that people will remember, you need to have a colour and a thing. We were going to call ourselves Holton Mill Managed Workspace, which is a big bit of a mouthful and really boring. Um, and this person said, no, 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 call yourself something really um, memorable that it needs to have a colour and a thing. So we called ourselves Green Elephant. Um, and that's me, really. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing. Um, Thank you, Chris. That's really inspiring. It sounds like you've got a whole sort of ecosystem and, and, and cooperative economy going up on in, in um, that part of Lancaster. Um, and I can't wait to visit and find out more. Um, um, yeah, everything the there. So um, and I, I think I saw in the comments that there are people who use use um, some of the facilities there and, and have commented on, on how great that is. Yeah. So we, we have um, a few minutes left. So I'm going to take um, I'm going to hopefully try and respond to some questions. But if there are still questions coming in, please put them in the chat. Um, and depending on, on the question, we'll see who, who will pick that up. Um, but um, before, because I'll probably forget before we finish, I want to just say thank you again, Chris, for joining us yeah, for this presentation welcome. and also Daniel from Lancaster City Council. Um, and I hope that everyone um, is, is inspired to learn more about cooperatives as, as a result of this. So I'm just looking at the questions that have been post posted. Um, so I think someone asked um, if they're a member of their their local cooperative supermarket, um, you know, what does that mean? Um, and I suppose it's because the cooperative group and our big retail societies are so large and they have so many millions of members, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you probably don't have the same control as in maybe a smaller cooperative in terms of decisions, but you should be invited to the annual general meeting. And as a member, you get to vote on, on certain decisions and you get copies of the annual reports. And you can also be elected to local councils and potentially at some point you can also potentially join boards and, and other things and have, have, a, have a bigger role. And you probably earn some dividends on your purchases um, every time that um, you um, buy, buy things. So, um, so that's a different way of being a member in a very big cooperative. Um, I think there was also questions asked, I think, related to community shares and, and raising finance and how you invest. Um, and I suppose in a private business, you might have angel investors and the more shares they buy and the more invest, the more control um, and votes they have. And in the cooperative, if you buy community shares, it's one member, one vote, regardless of how many shares you buy. So that's where that democratic um, dem democracy, can't say the word, sorry, democracy comes in um, and makes it very equitable. Um, so you, so we do sometimes have um, not only um, individual members buying shares in cooperatives, but also institutions and high net worth investors, but they do that so on the same basis as everyone else and they don't have more control than anyone else. So it's very democratic. Um, and I think there was also a question from Monica on whether um, cooperatives can access um, European funding and, and other grants. And, and yes, indeed they can. Um, and there's no reason why they, they can't um, access that kind of funding. Um, I'm just checking the other questions. Um, so I think it was Kate who said that they're a regular user of the high, we have too many highs. We have the high business support program <laughs> that's delivered yes. by Cooperatives UK and we have the high, but it's a very popular name. Um, and just checking if there's any more questions. Yeah, there's a question. What All right, so there's another question from Monica that's asked, I think this one's directed to Chris. Um, it says, 
Is there a joint overall owner for the project or are all individual carts put together for the Green Elephant Project? Um, it's very inspiring, um, Monica says. Okay, um, Lancaster Co-Housing, who redeveloped the site, are the overall owner of the entire site. They own the freehold. Um, and the, the people who have a house on site have got a 999 year lease so they can raise a mortgage and green elephant has has a lease on the as a head lease on the mill and we then sublet to our tenants um so that's sort of um a sort of the ownership structure if you like of the properties um and but any profits being generated by green elephant are reinvested in the building um in and the members and um the the idea um, behind setting up the the project was that it should not be a burden on anybody who wanted to buy a house here and so it it was aimed to be sort of cost neutral as far as anybody who was wanting to move into to one of the properties and it's changed the what could have just been a little um sort of nice little housing estate into something more in that we have the the mill is a it's a sort of interaction between us and the local community and and we're a community resource we we host kids but anything from children's birthday parties to um various talks and i mean if i'm honest it works because there is a baseline of of the tenants paying their rents that that sort of helps the the community space so there, there's a sort of um, interaction between the two and and there's benefits to the individual tenants of of the sort of people who come on courses people who come on yoga then then sort of buy things off the the tenants thanks chris that's a really helpful answer and i think um there's lots of praise for what you're doing i think um someone else um, michael has said that Holton Mill is a jewel in the Lancaster district crown and others that are not local um, from London I can't wait to come up and, and visit. Um, so, um, so lots of praise um, for all the good work you're doing and lots of similarities in the way facilities that you provide um, as, as I mentioned earlier, Friends of Stretford Public Court. Yeah, I thought slightly different be, setting, but be. slightly different building, but yeah. we... Um, we don't quite have a dedicated yoga, yoga space. It does, they do have to remove their mats, but um, yes, yoga and well-being is a big part of what yeah. we do at, at Friends of Stratford Public Hall as well. Um, so I can't see any more questions at the moment, um, unless anyone wants to ask a quick question now, or if there's anything you wanted to add before we finish. So what I might do is um, I might just share um, my last slides um, to say what support is available for anyone that wants to learn more about cooperatives or wants support to set up their cooperative um, and where they can go for that support. So I'll just quickly share my last slides again. Hopefully this will work. Um, is that on full screen? No, full screen. Um, so um, yes, too many highs, but uh, Cooperatives UK, the High Business Support Programme, this is the programme that we're doing with our partner, the Cooperative Bank, um, so people can apply if they're setting up their cooperative for support, they can get up to 10 days of support, it's an open application form, um, I'm sure my colleague as we speak is putting the link in, in, in the chat if you want to look, look out for that. Um, Members of Cooperatives UK can also access all the services we provide at Cooperatives UK around HR, culture, governance, finance, um, all of those things are available. We um, offer a, a range of training sessions, particularly around how to be a good director and everything else that goes around the governance of, of running your cooperative. And we also have um, the community shares unit um, that has lots of resources and how to do your community share offer. Um, and we have a programme called the Community Shares Booster Programme. So if you're at the point of having incorporated your organisation and you want to do a share offer, you can apply for development support and also matched equity funding. So for every pound raised from your community, um, we will match that to a certain extent. So those are the programmes that are available and the support that's available. Um, and as I say, we will 
share this uh, these slides um, later, be uploaded, and I will share the link with you. Um, and we've put lots of links in, in the chat as well. Um, the final slide is this, this link. This is the link that you go to for Cooperatives UK, um, and that has all the programmes that I mentioned and has all the useful tools about starting your cooperative. And when we share the link, we'll also point you to the support and services that are available at Lancaster City Council. So I'll stop sharing there um, and just check if there's been any more questions. Um, we have a couple more minutes left before we finish. Um, just check. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I think lots of questions about whether we will be circulating the slides, so we most definitely will. Um, Okay, I think there was a question about sharing the chat. I didn't know that that was, wasn't possible, so apologies for that. And I'm sorry about any sound or technical difficulties we had at the beginning. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Is there anything else that anyone, Daniel or Chris, you wanted to add at this stage before we finish um, the webinar? Um, is there anything else? Just, we've got a couple more minutes before we... Well, just, just like to mention close. that there's a brief survey as well that will be circulated with the slides um, to everyone that's attended. So if anyone's interested in sharing information, sharing thoughts, ideas that we can pick up on and that kind of ties into my work to maybe facilitate future events like this. Um, yeah, really appreciate if you could fill in that survey because that would be useful for me. Yes, so that's great. No, that's a good um, reminder. We'll also be sending a survey to see how the webinar went. But um, yes, if, if you'd want support, particularly if you want to talk to Daniel at Lancaster City Council, please do look out for those links. Um, and I think I think there's lots of people interested in being able to speak to you, Chris, as well. Are you, are you happy for us to circulate an email or, or would you rather not have lots of inquiries? No, 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 no. We're very happy on on the as one of the cooperative principles is to support other co-ops. We're more than happy. Um, yeah, one of one of one of my fellow sort of management team is is a, a former journalist. So we're 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 very sort of media and um, sort of inquiry friendly um, as a co-op. And and that goes the same for me with um, wearing my hat at, at Stratford Public Hall. We we were always having visitors coming to see how we did things at the hall and how we raised our funds from community shares. So very happy to entertain that. Um, and part of the support that we give through the High Business Support Programme is peer mentoring, where we actually fund a cooperative's time to talk to you and share their experience and learnings. So that that's always um, very useful to new groups setting up. So I think I don't think there's any more questions or, or anything. Um, yeah, so I think people were asking why there's so many up north. It's because this particular um, webinar in terms of case studies was focused on Lancaster and the, the region. And so I selected ones that were kind of as close as possible in the Northwest. Um, but of course we have cooperatives across the UK, lots of examples, there are 7,000 to choose from. And some of our webinars have focused on, on other case studies. So do look, have a look at the recordings. It's not that we, we don't have cooperatives in other parts of the country, it's just this one was particularly sort of focused on this, this part of the world. Um, so yeah, happy um, to share other examples if that's, that's useful. Um, so I don't think there's any more questions. Um, I think yeah so I think we'll we'll finish it there we're I think we're just about on time so thanks again um to Chris for joining us it was very inspiring to hear about your particular cooperative and thanks again um to Daniel um it's been great to be able to deliver this in partnership with Lancaster City Council um and we look forward to working together um going forward um so thanks everyone for attending and we'll finish it there <laughs>